Edge of Everything, Epilogue to the Edge of Collapse series, written by Kyla Stone, read for you by Stacy Glemboski. Chapter 1. Quinn, Day 364. A year can seem like forever, or it can pass by in the blink of an eye. This year, the first year after the collapse, was something altogether different. Tomorrow, Quinn Riley would turn 17. Tomorrow was Christmas Eve. It was also the one-year anniversary of Gramps' death, when the world went to hell. She couldn't even imagine the girl she was a year ago, sullen, sarcastic, and eager to escape the wreck her mother had made of both their lives. Now, she couldn't imagine leaving Fall Creek for any reason. It was her home, her fortress, and she defended it as such. Quinn, Whitney called. Quit daydreaming and come on. Quinn rolled her eyes. I'm coming, I'm coming, hold your horses. Some citizens of Fall Creek owned horses and rode them daily. Shoveling horse crap from the streets of downtown Fall Creek was now a real job. Quinn liked horses but she preferred her diesel Arctic Cat UTV, which ran on biofuel. She leapt off the parked UTV, grabbed her AR-15, and checked her surroundings. The brick two- and three-story buildings of St. Joseph rose on all sides. The streets were deserted, but trash had blown everywhere, collecting along the curbs and piling in doorways and on sidewalks. A frigid gust whipped her scarf around her face. Her black hair was pulled back in a tight, practical ponytail, a gray knit hat pulled low over her ears. She wore hunter green hiking pants beneath fleece-lined leggings, a heavy coat, and gloves. Still, the cold stung her cheeks as she crossed the street. Winter had arrived again. This time, they were prepared. They'd worked their butts off this summer and fall, growing everything they could get their hands on, potatoes, corn and wheat, cucumbers, lettuce, tomatoes, grapes, apples, and berries. The crops were harvested and stored, fruits and veggies canned, root cellars filled. Their greenhouses and winter gardens were built and ready to continue growing throughout the winter. They'd all chopped more seasoned wood than they ever wanted to, but their sheds and garages were stuffed to the brim and they'd scavenged and traded for several old diesel generators that could run on various fuels. Winter was here, but they'd survive it like they'd survived everything else. Hurry it up, Perez said. My tush is freezing out here. After clearing the building, she stood watch outside the shop with Mara Wright, one of Fall Creek's newest deputized police officers. They both carried big, wicked guns and looked incredibly intimidating. Quinn strode toward them. It's almost like you hate shopping or something. Perez scowled. Hated it before the apocalypse and hate it even more now. But now everything's free. Whitney tugged her red hair behind her ears with one gloved hand and awkwardly adjusted her pistol. She preferred a trowel and spade over guns, unlike Quinn. One perk of the collapse, right? Quinn rolled her eyes good-naturedly. Way to see the upside of hell. Whitney smiled shyly. For a while, Quinn had worried that Whitney Blair would become a depressed shell of herself, like her mother, who'd never recovered from her husband's murder at the hands of the militia. Whitney was coming around, though. She'd never volunteer to stand watch, like Quinn and Jonas, but she worked tirelessly with the food production teams and often volunteered to help teach the younger kids with Travis. The former bubbly cheerleader had found a way to make it through, just like Quinn. More than that, they were friends. Perez gazed over their heads, keeping her eye on the windows and rooftops of the buildings behind them. Anything worthwhile is already long gone. Not everything, Quinn said. You planning to chat all day, ladies? Or are you coming? Jonas called from somewhere inside the store. 
Quinn grinned and ducked inside the shop after Jonas. Whitney followed her, but more cautiously. Gray light leaked through the broken windows, draping everything in heavy shadows. The store was called Belle's Boutique. Fancy dresses lined the walls, ball gowns made of silk and tulle in birthday cake colors like taffy pink, magenta, sherbet orange, and bright purple. Shriveled flower petals were scattered across the dusty floor. Their boots crunched through shattered glass from a crystal vase that had fallen from the front counter. Little dishes of potpourri sat on a glass coffee table beside a velvet couch in the center of the shop. It smelled of dust and disuse, of mothballs and dead flowers. Jonas made a choking sound. I can only imagine how this place smelled before. Too many flowers, too much perfume. Don't pretend you don't love it. Whitney headed left toward a section of floor-length gowns. Quinn stayed close to Jonas, her heart rate increasing a bit. And it wasn't just because they were outside the safety of Fall Creek. Jonas stood, staring at the aisles of prom dresses, pageant dresses, and exotic cocktail numbers. I'd ask you, you know. She stiffened. What? To prom. I'd ask you. The AR resting on its sling, she fingered a silky, gauzy mermaid dress. Quinn wasn't the type to go to prom anyway. Nope. No thank you. Not in a million years. And yet, her throat closed up at the thought of no more proms. No pretty girls in pretty dresses. No awkward boys dancing to stupid songs beneath glittering lights. Everybody just waiting to get drunk later. And yet, here she was, at the end of civilization, being asked to prom by the one guy she might have actually said yes to. A year later, and the losses could still kick you in the gut when you least expected it. She cleared her throat, tried not to let him see how her stomach had flip-flopped, grateful for the shadows to hide her reddening cheeks. You didn't even know who I was. Sure I did. Hard to miss Quinn Riley. You were fierce even before the big bad guns and that killer knife you carry around everywhere. Jonas shot her a coy grin. And pretty. Her face went hot. You never talked to me. Because I was afraid you would hit me with nunchucks or something or nail me in the nuts with that slingshot of yours. Her chest swelled with a sense of satisfaction. I probably would have. He raised his brows. See? You got what you needed, or are you back there trying on dresses? Perez shouted from the doorway. We don't have all day, you know. Just a few more minutes. He glanced toward the door, where Perez and Wright faced away from them, watching the empty street. Whitney was rummaging through a back room, searching for food, Scissors, anything useful. His gaze swung back toward Quinn, his eyes darkening. We're alone. Yeah, I can see that. So, he took a step toward her. His swoop of blonde hair fell over his blue eyes, as if he'd styled it that way. He'd grown taller. As a football player, he'd always been fit. But his body had grown tough and wiry from a year of hard manual labor. So had hers, though she was clearly still a girl. He grinned. How about another kiss? Quinn punched him in the arm. Not now. He stepped back and rubbed his arm. That hurt. It was supposed to. We're on a mission. Liam says not to let anything distract you, remember? Jonas rolled his eyes but he was still grinning. He had that laid back, resilient personality. You could knock him down and he'd just bounce back up again. But he was persistent too. They both knew he'd get that kiss later. You think she'll like it? Jonas asked as they headed deeper into the store, necks on a swivel for their target. She'll like it, Quinn said, not a doubt in her mind. Hannah would never do this for herself. And Liam would never think of it in a hundred years. Quinn, though, was on the ball.
They didn't do careless things. They didn't hop into a car and run to Mishawaka to hit up Super Target or head to Grand Haven for a Lakeview dinner. Nothing was ever wasted. Everyone took care with everything. Some extraneous things were worth it, though. Like art. Like music. And this. Quinn waded deeper into the store, Jonas at her side, as they passed lovely dress after lovely dress. Puffy, frilly frocks no one would ever wear again. Not for a long time, anyway. Would they rot here? Grow moldy and moth-eaten? Maybe. Or maybe someone would find a use for them in this new world. And there, along the back wall, a whole rack of white, sparkly, fluffy gowns. Wedding dresses. Chapter 2. Quinn. Day 364. Something appeared ahead. Something in the road that didn't belong. A figure drove a tractor down the middle of M139. Quinn and Jonas rode in the UTV, Jonas driving, Quinn with her weapon at the ready, scanning the fields and buildings as they left the outskirts of St. Joe and headed south toward Fall Creek. The wedding dress they'd chosen was wrapped carefully within a couple of trash bags, bound with duct tape and tied to the back of the four-wheeler. Adrenaline shot through her. Hey! she shouted over the growl of the ATV engines. Not like he would hear her. He heard the ATVs, though. The figure twisted around, glancing back at them before facing forward again and continuing to drive. She didn't blame him. Anyone could be out here. Those wandering the roads were usually desperate. Not necessarily evil, but willing to do anything for a little food or the promise of shelter. They were still five miles outside of town. Though the security teams had barricades at every entry point into Fall Creek, it was better to stop the interloper now, before he even got within sight of their town. Wright drove up beside them. Behind her, Perez made a motion, but they already knew what to do. They'd all been trained for this. Jonas sped up as Quinn raised the AR and braced it as best she could. Shooting was crap on a moving vehicle, but the threat alone worked 95% of the time. They drove parallel to the tractor, who was chugging along at its fastest speed of 25 miles per hour. Perez flanked his other side, while Whitney took up the rear. Once they'd flanked him, Quinn shouted, Stop right there! The tractor driver's head swiveled to either side. His eyes widened, his pale face going white. He had no choice, and he knew it. He wore dirty jeans, scuffed boots, and a heavy winter coat, a shotgun held across his lap. He looked dirty, like he hadn't had a good bath in a month at least. Swiftly, he stopped the tractor and raised both hands high in the air. His hands were shaking. He was afraid. Jonas halted to his left. On his right, Wright pulled up, and Perez aimed her Sig Sauer MPX carbine at his head. Whitney trailed behind them on her rusty blue ATV. A growling shape rose from the seat beside the driver. A large, thickly furred dog with seal gray fur, a white mask across her face, and a fluffy tail curled over her back. Her perky ears tilted forward, and she barked at them in warning. Hush, Nova, the driver said in a hoarse voice. The Siberian Husky didn't hush. She barked louder. Keep your hands up, Perez said. Don't make a move toward that shotgun. Quinn didn't take her eyes off him, her every sense on high alert. Her finger wasn't on the trigger, but it could be in a millisecond. Liam had trained her well. I mean no harm, the man said shakily. We'll decide that, Perez said. My name is Oliver. I'm on my way to a town called Fall Creek to see Hannah. Quinn's heart rate quickened. Excitement roiled in her chest. You're here for Hannah. The man smiled, relief flooding his features. And in that smile, she glimpsed something familiar. I'm her brother. 
He was maybe in his early 30s, of average height and build, with dirty blonde hair lighter than Hannah's. He had her green eyes, though, that same soft strength in his face, a stubborn tilt to his square jaw. Quinn lowered her rifle. Sorry about that. We can never be too careful. And you can lower your hands now. Oliver obliged. He ran one hand across his dog's torso to calm her. She ceased barking, but glared at Quinn for having the audacity to pull a gun on her owner. Quinn liked her already. Well then, Oliver, Perez drawled dryly. Welcome to the party. Oliver glanced between them, confused. What do you mean? What party? Follow us, Jonas said. We'll show you. Quinn couldn't hide her grin. Looks like we're bringing two surprises home for Hannah. Chapter three, Hannah, one year. I'm so glad you're here, Hannah said to Oliver, her brother. She still couldn't fully believe that he was really standing right here in front of her. You're late though, Quinn said. I thought you were supposed to be here a month ago. Oliver shrugged. He'd taken a shower at one of the Winter Haven houses with working solar power and dressed in some of Liam's clean clothes. That was the plan. They were at Molly's place. Quinn lived with Hannah now, but Bishop had moved into Molly's old house because it was warm and cozy. It had a wood stove for cooking, as well as Molly's preps hidden in the basement to keep safe. The scent of rosemary, sage, and butter filled her nostrils. Annette, Dave, and Evelyn were making mashed potatoes and Molly's chili recipe. Evelyn was gone three days a week as part of a mobile hospital tent traveling from town to town, but she'd made sure to return for the wedding and Christmas. This was a rehearsal dinner of sorts, only they hadn't rehearsed anything. It was an excuse to gather friends and family and celebrate another day of hard-earned life. Quinn and Milo had decorated the house with red and green wreaths, with a big Christmas tree in one corner. Candles flickered from bookcases and end tables. The cats lounged beneath the tree like fluffy presents. Loki had already tried to knock it over twice, but was as yet unsuccessful. Somewhat surprisingly, Ghost had greeted Oliver's Siberian husky with interest. His ears perked immediately, and he gave her a welcoming chuff. Nova, for her part, didn't wait for Oliver's approval, but trotted right up to Ghost, tail wagging. They circled each other in the center of the living room, oblivious to whom they might knock over with their large furry bodies as they sniffed each other intently. I'd say you're right on time, Hannah said warmly. She couldn't stop smiling or crying. Whenever she looked at her brother, her throat got thick and her vision got blurry. She couldn't stop hugging him either. He looked just like their father. Five years of separation, but all that time had melted away like it had never existed. Their shared memories bound them forever. They were family, and he would become a part of Fall Creek like she had. Quinn glanced at her watch. I've got security duty at the North Barricade in 20 minutes. Gotta run. Get some food before you go. Hannah said, and dress warmly, it's cold out. Quinn rolled her eyes at Hannah's protective mothering, but they both knew she secretly enjoyed it. Happy birthday, Hannah said. Take some cake with you. Since she had volunteered for duty tonight, they'd all enjoyed the homemade cake before dinner. It was made with eggs, flour, dried fruits, and honey in lieu of granulated sugar. Bakers had to be creative these days. Reynoso and Bishop started in on another round of happy birthday, and Quinn blushed fiercely. She gave them the finger, slipped on her coat and gloves, and jogged out into the frigid night, forgetting the food and the cake. I'll bring her something, Jonas said, and an extra slice. Hannah nodded her thanks at him. Liam shuffled toward them still using his cane, but not as heavily as he had months ago. 
his gait was nearly back to normal. For several months, he'd been working his legs and back for a few hours every day. Evelyn helped him with exercises the doctors at Lakeland Hospital had taught them. The hospital had procured an industrial diesel generator and could power a couple of operating rooms and a few ICU beds. She knew that the physical therapy was arduous and painful, but he never let up, not for one single second. Liam settled into a nearby chair. LJ, who'd been playing with some blocks, caught sight of his uncle and immediately wobbled to his feet and toddled toward him. Liam swooped him up into his lap as LJ let out a peal of giggles. Not to be outdone, Charlotte scrabbled after him, tugging on Liam's pant legs to pull herself to her feet. How was your journey? Liam asked Oliver. Oliver swiped at his face. Long and dangerous. His eyes were tired. Hannah missed the mischievous gleam in his gaze and hoped it wasn't snuffed out forever. He was a fun, carefree person, but the last year had ground it out of him. I almost died a half dozen times. I haven't had a good meal in weeks. And the people. A haunted look crossed his face. A lot of them didn't make it through the winter. Most of those that did are pretty desperate. Things had happened to him on his journey from the Upper Peninsula to Southwest Michigan, that was clear. Outside Southwest Michigan, things were especially rough. Charlie Hamilton and the National Guard had done excellent work expelling thieves and bands of raiders and making the highways safer. Six months ago, the Michigan National Guard had attacked the syndicate, broken them, and driven them out of Indiana. Only a remnant remained in the stronghold of Chicago. Hamilton didn't have enough soldiers to protect even half of Michigan. Detroit was devolving into further chaos, gangs roving further and further into rural territory in search of supplies to steal and people to hurt. The U.S. was still years away from a recovery. Everyone felt the impact of that fact every single day. But what had happened, and what Oliver had been forced to do, those were questions for another time. Hannah closed her hand over his. You don't have to tell us now. There's plenty of time for that later. His gaze dropped to her crooked fingers. His expression contorted in a mixture of anger, regret, and grief. She'd told him about it on the ham radio, but it wasn't like seeing the damage in person. Hannah, that's the past, Hannah said. She bent and picked up Charlotte, who was using the furniture to hold herself up as she teetered around the room and held her toward Oliver. This is the future. Oliver took his niece in his arms and tickled her tummy. She giggled. Mama, she cried, using her first and so far only word. She was fat, healthy, beautiful, and a handful. LJ was walking, and Charlotte was determined to follow in his footsteps as soon as possible. Milo trotted up to her, barely avoiding tripping over Ghost and Nova, who were still busy circling and sniffing each other, as he held a bowl precariously over his head. His slingshot stuck out from his back pocket. I brought you dinner. At nine years old, he was taller, leaner, smart, and capable. Charlie Hamilton had ensured the boy had the hydrocortisone he needed for his Addison's disease. In eight months, he hadn't gone into adrenal crisis or experienced worse than a couple of colds. He was strong and healthy. Hannah was blessed. What a difference a year made. She took the bowl of steaming chili. Thank you. Oliver eyed the dogs. They sat side by side in the center of the living room. Nova had begun licking Ghost's snout. He didn't seem to mind it a bit. You know. Bishop started, a mischievous glint in his eyes. The way things are going with those two, we might have some new additions to the family soon. For a second, Milo stared at him, confused. Then his expression cleared, and a brilliant smile split his face. Puppies! Oh boy, Liam deadpanned. 
We could use some more guard dogs, Reynoso said happily. You know it's true. I'll adopt the first one. You'll adopt them all, you mean, Hannah said, but she was smiling. That would be the best present ever, Milo said. He turned to Hannah. Merry Christmas Eve, Mom. Merry Christmas Eve, son. She pulled him into a one-handed hug and met Liam's gaze over his head. This was an enjoyable party, but she was looking forward to a few minutes alone with him after their friends had left and the kids were sleeping. Maybe more than a few minutes. Liam met her gaze, his lip twitching as if he could read her thoughts. Tomorrow, this man would become her husband. She could hardly wait. Evelyn wrapped one arm around her husband's waist and raised a glass of apple juice as a toast. Merry Christmas, everyone. Chapter Four Hannah One Year and One Day The wedding dress was perfect. It was a simple but elegant cream silk sheath that skimmed her body and flared at the shins with tiny sparkly beads that caught the sunlight. It was sleeveless, but Quinn and Jonas had found a long, white fur cape that draped her shoulders perfectly. The day was chilly, but not freezing. Soft snowflakes tumbled from the sky, everything swirling soft and white like a snow globe. White blanketed the ground and clung to the branches of the trees, their limbs sheathed in ice crystals. Though it was snowing, a hint of sunlight peeked through the clouds and made the snow and ice glitter like stars. Bishop had offered the church sanctuary for the service, but it hadn't felt right. Instead, they held the wedding at the park near the river. Out here, with the wide dome of the sky above them, the trees all around, standing as silent sentinels, as observers to this special, singular moment, this felt right. Half of Fall Creek had gathered for the outdoor service. They sat in camping chairs, metal folding chairs brought over from the courthouse and wooden benches. No one had dressed up, but no one needed to. They wore work clothes, boots, and coats, their ears and noses red, their eyes shining. Hannah, Oliver, and Milo clustered together at the back of the crowd, waiting for everyone to get settled. It was almost three o'clock. She took Oliver's arm. I was so afraid that you'd miss this. Are you kidding me? I wouldn't miss it if the world were ending. They smiled at each other, brother and sister, family lost and miraculously found. You look beautiful, little sis. She blushed. It's your job to say that. Maybe so, but that doesn't mean it's not true. Since it was winter, Hannah held no wedding bouquet of flowers. That didn't matter. She didn't need them. She didn't even need the dress or the ceremony. Only Liam. But Bishop had insisted, saying that rituals were still important to people. Coming together, celebrating community, each other, survival. And Quinn, who had never cared for pretty or sparkly things before, had taken a sudden interest. Going in secret to pick out a real wedding dress? That had surprised Hannah. And because of the thoughtfulness and love behind those actions, it was the most gorgeous wedding gown that any bride had ever worn. Hannah swallowed and looked down the center aisle. A long strip of blue cloth stretched across the snowy ground between the chairs filled with the townspeople she knew and loved. Butterflies flitted in her stomach. She hadn't thought she'd be nervous, but she was. She wanted to look perfect for Liam. This day meant so much to them both. No, not this day, but all the days that would come after. Now, Mom? Milo asked in a loud whisper. Hannah gave him a nod. Milo switched on the iPod connected to the speaker set on a metal folding chair. Then E. King's Stand By Me filled the air. The guests shifted in anticipation, twisting around to take in the bride, their faces alight. From the third row, Annette smiled back at her. She held Joey, 
the little boy that Quinn and Molly had saved, in her lap. Nova sat panting at her feet. Oliver squeezed her arm. Dad would be so proud of you. I'm proud of you. Me too. Milo jumped to his feet and trotted to her opposite side. He looped his arm through hers, imitating Oliver. Her brother and her son on either side of her. Ahead of her, her groom waited. Oliver winked at Milo. Ready? Milo straightened his narrow shoulders, his face beaming. Ready. She nodded, her vision going blurry, her throat tight. Not with sadness, but with joy, with anticipation, with love. In only a few moments, she would give herself fully and completely to the man she loved, the man she couldn't imagine living without. She thought of her parents, of Molly, of Cece, and even Noah. All the people who weren't here that should be, that would live on in her heart. Despite the darkness surrounding them, there was light here, an ember of hope brightly flickering. Hannah walked down the aisle. Chapter five, Liam, one year and one day. Liam watched Hannah glide down the aisle. He couldn't take his eyes off her, his heart thudding hard against his ribs, his blood buzzing and alive, so alive. Ghost stood at Liam's side as best man, filling in splendidly for Bishop. Presiding over the ceremony, Bishop stood behind a simple wooden pedestal he'd removed from Crossway Church. A wooden trellis, wrapped with fluttering white and blue ribbons, arched above them. Travis, Dave, and Reynoso were groomsmen, while Quinn, Evelyn, and Perez were bridesmaids. Evelyn held LJ, who was watching the crowd curiously, while Quinn carried a squirming Charlotte, who wanted to be on her feet, getting into mischief as usual. Liam and Hannah had wanted the babies to be part of the wedding. This was more than a coming together of two people. It was a blending of family. Liam scratched Ghost's ears. The peer pressed his fluffy torso against Liam's thigh and chuffed his encouragement. Liam stood tall as he waited for his bride. Molly's cane had aided him for the last six months, but no more. He stood on his own. He walked on his own. And someday soon, he would run again, too. He had been working toward this day, this moment, when he would greet his new bride on his own two feet tall and proud. His spine still hurt, but pain was nothing. Pain got you to where you needed to go. Once you got through it, the other side was everything. This was everything. Hannah glided toward him. He couldn't wait for her to reach him, so he stepped forward and went to her, took her hands in his as Oliver and Milo released her, both of them grinning broadly. She went to him, her eyes bright, her hair pulled back in a braided bun, soft tendrils framing her radiant face. She was so beautiful, it took his breath away. The watching crowd disappeared. The bridesmaids and groomsmen standing on either side of the trellis, Bishop behind his pedestal, the trees, the softly falling snow, the frozen lake beyond, it all vanished. He had eyes only for Hannah. He took her in his arms and pulled her to him, maybe a little too roughly, but he couldn't help himself. He leaned down and kissed her, his bride, deeply and hungrily. Bishop cleared his throat. Uh, that's a bit out of order, friend. Quinn rolled her eyes. Ugh, guys, save it for the honeymoon. Warm-hearted laughter rippled through the crowd. There wouldn't be a honeymoon, of course, not in this world. But he didn't need one. Her presence was enough, the promise that she would remain at his side forever. With effort, Liam pulled back. Sorry, he said, but clearly he wasn't. 
Bishop gave him a knowing grin as the last chords of Stand By Me faded into stillness. Friends, he said, we've gathered here together to celebrate. Even after all we've lost, all we've endured, and all that we face ahead of us, it is crucial to embrace the good things, for there are good things. We have each other. We have built dear friendships that we didn't have before. For some of us, we've found something even more special. I think we can all agree that Hannah and Liam have forged a special bond. Hear, hear, Dave called. A few whistles trickled through the crowd, probably Quinn's friends. Hannah smiled up at Liam. You're walking, on your own. He smiled back. I am. She leaned into him, her arms around his waist, her heart beating against his chest. I love you, you know. I love you. What God has brought together, Bishop continued undeterred, let no man separate. Liam barely remembered the rest of the ceremony. Bishop was a good speaker, but he couldn't hold a candle to Hannah. And then everyone was cheering, clapping, and whistling. Ghost barked with enthusiasm. So did Nova. Kiss the girl already, Reynoso yelled. And Liam did. We hope you have enjoyed Edge of Everything, Epilogue to the Edge of Collapse series, written by Kyla Stone, read for you by Stacy Glomboski. The audio for this short was engineered by Anansi Audio. Thank you for listening. Hi, this is Kyla Stone. I hope you enjoyed my audiobook. If you'd like to keep getting free audiobooks from me, please like and subscribe to support my channel. Thank you, and happy listening.